Hello, everyone. This is Kate Myers, Senior Program Officer with the California Healthcare Foundation. And I'm thrilled today to be hosting this webinar uh, with Jean Acevedo on community-based palliative care fee-for-service billing strategies. As many of you know from working with CHCF over the years, we've had a number of efforts related to increasing access to community-based palliative care. Of course, a big focus of our work is around sustainability of community-based palliative care services. And while we're thrilled that payer-provider partnerships are increasing in California, um, we do know that fee-for-service is still alive and well in palliative care. And we wanted to make sure that our um, California stakeholders in palliative care have access to the most up-to-date, um, detailed information from one of really our nation's experts in fee-for-service billing strategies in palliative care. So I'm really excited today to be able to introduce, um, in just a few moments, Jean Acevedo. Jean is the president and senior consultant at Acevedo Consulting. She has uh, 30 years of healthcare experience, including a particular expertise in chart audits, compliance, and education related to physician documentation and coding. She's a frequently sought after speaker as she possesses the unique perspectives of avoiding risk and liability while optimizing reimbursement in what we know is a highly regulated healthcare industry. In 2014, Jean was presented with a Presidential Citation Award by the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine for providing AAHP members with a greater understanding of complex coding, reimbursement, and regulatory compliance issues for nearly a decade. A few housekeeping items before we begin. If you could advance the slide, thank you. On today's webinar, we have all lines for our participants muted. Uh, you'll be able to submit questions through the Zoom webinar platform through the Q&A located at the bottom center of your screen. If you hover your mouse over the bottom center of your screen, please use the Q&A platform and not the chat function so that we can keep our questions in one place. And Jean will have a few minutes at the end to address those. We are recording this session. We will also um, be making the recording and Jean's slides available on CHCF's website within about two weeks. And we're really excited that Jean is also going to be putting together a handbook um, capturing a lot of the key points from the webinar, but also augmenting it with some information about some of the rules that are going into effect on January 1st. And that handbook should be on CHCF's web, website in February. I also just wanted to extend huge thanks to Jean for being with us today amidst um, a case of laryngitis. So she is persevering through and has kept her voice quiet for most of the morning to help us um, be able to hear her today. So thanks to Jean. And with that, I think we'll advance to the next slide and, and Jean can go ahead. Thank you so very much, Kate. Yeah, for anybody who's heard me speak, I probably don't sound quite the same today. I've been preserving my voice for this hour. Um, and since it is only an hour, and actually I'm gonna to try to keep it under that so that we do have time for some questions. As you can understand, I won't be able to get into as much detail as I want to go into when I um, speak to providers and others individuals about reimbursement issues and documentation and coding. Um, there were some changes in the 2019 Medicare Physician Fee Schedule Rule. I'll highlight those at the end. There aren't too many that are actually for next year going to impact palliative care, um, not when it comes to the typical visits. There are plenty of new services coming uh, as the Medicare program and CMS tries to bring itself into the 21st century with technology, or what they're calling virtual check-in visits and expansion of remote patient monitoring, et cetera. And because those things are very new and the only documentation that we have so far is what was published in the final fee schedule rule is one of the reasons why we're gonna wait until probably February to make sure that to have the handbook finished so that we can hopefully have more specific guidance for you guys so that you don't wind up with something that isn't as complete as you want. The disclaimer that's up here is really important because of all of that. Um, Medicare has a tendency to change the rules as we go. My biggest fear always is that I'm speaking 
and behind my back, there's someone at CMS who has changed or revised something that I've been fully aware of so that everything I'm saying is not exactly correct. But I think we're pretty going to be pretty much on target today. I wouldn't worry about it. So what am I going to go over? Um, I have to talk about evaluation and management services. That's the bread and butter for a palliative program. And I will speak to billing based on time as well as what some physicians in particular call choosing the E&M code based on complexity or the three key components. Then I will spend a little bit of time on advanced care planning and then some of the more non-traditional services that have come up with CMS over the last, where are we, 2018, the last three years or so. Chronic care management, non-face-to-face -face prolonged services, and that new virtual check-in service that I had referenced. As I mentioned, I will try to have this finished in about 40, 45 minutes so that we do have some time for questions. Oh, and do know that as you enter your questions in the question area of the technology, anything we do not get to, the uh, Healthcare Foundation will get to me in writing and I will include them as an FAQ in the handbook. So everything will indeed be answered one way or the other. Okay, so let's talk about evaluation and management services. So just in general, since I have no idea who my audience is to know if you know anything at all about this, these are the billable encounters, the visits that um, the physician, non-physician practitioner, nurse practitioner gets to bill when they're seeing a patient in palliative care. They must, they really only have two criteria. One, it must be medically necessary and there must be a face-to-face -face visit. Now the medical necessity component in palliative care becomes very important. Um, I've been lucky and blessed to have worked with providers throughout the country for the last more than a decade and watch the evolution and acceptance of palliative care services. Um, I also know that as part of what it is that you guys do, there are terms of art that are used that don't support medical necessity to the typical person who doesn't have a clue what palliative care is all about. And by that I mean um, statements such as the patient is being seen for goals of care, well, we will follow and support the patient with you, et cetera. When medical necessity is being thought about and the Medicare program does require that for the services I'm going to be speaking about today, they all meet the medical necessity test, there must be an underlying medical condition that you're addressing. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And obviously everything must be face-to-face -face for evaluation and management services. So you know you're with the patient, there's a medical problem that you're addressing. Um, so then what does the provider need to consider? Well, if you're seeing the patient at home in an assisted living facility or any other outpatient setting, one has to be concerned with whether or not the patient is a new patient or an established patient. And there's a technical definition for this. You would find it in the CPT code book. Um, in its simplest terms, a new patient is one who has not had a professional service by the physician, nurse practitioner, billed to any payer ever or within the last three years, either by that clinician personally or by another physician, nurse practitioner within your group within the last three years. And the group um, idea is important. And the best way to think about that is if we all work for the same tax ID. Now, if you're doing any um, inpatient work, go to the hospital, the nursing home, the new and established patient concept just doesn't apply. But we're talking community-based palliative care, so I'm not gonna spend much time on that. But obviously the new patient and established patient visit concept really does uh, become very important. So once you've determined the right type of service, you know where you are, you're at home because there are um, codes for home visits, or you're at an assisted living facility, say, or the nursing facility. And there are separate code sets for those as well. And if you're in the outpatient setting, home assisted living, you, knew whether, you know whether it's a new or established patient. Or if you're in the uh, nursing home, whether skilled or non, now we don't worry about new or established patients. It's just whether or not this is the initial, i.e., is this the first visit 
face-to-face -face visit by me or a colleague in my organization to this patient for this admission, or are we following up? All right, you've gone through all of that. Now you have to choose the right level of service. And at home, for a new patient, home visits or assisted living, you have five different levels of service. For established patients, you have, is it now I have to think off the top of my head, four. And in the nursing home, there are three initial nursing home visits and four subsequent. So as anybody who's not a clinician could easily see, there's no not one one-to-one uh, -one correlation across the continuum of these evaluation and management codes, making it difficult for all physicians, nurse practitioners, clinical nurse specialists, anybody else who can build these codes to try to figure out, the heck do I know that I'm choosing the right code? And then on top of it, they have to worry about, all right, how do I choose the level? I know where I am. I know this is an established patient stay at home. How do I choose one of those four levels? And you have two different ways to do this, either on complexity, so how much history, physical exam, medical decision-making was documented, regardless of how much time that took, or separate from that, how much time did I spend with the patient face-to-face -face as, um, as long as more than half of that time was spent in activities of counseling or coordination of care. And then in that situation, there's no requirement for a review of systems. There's actually no requirement that you even examine the patient. And I always want to say that uh, it's far beyond my pay grade to tell a clinician whether or not to examine a patient. Just from a coding perspective, you're choosing the code based on time because more than half of your time is spent in counseling or care coordination. It's just not a requirement from a coding perspective. So let's look at each of these a little bit. For the key components, history exam, medical decision making um, is on the left. And then there is, of course, these other elements, the counseling, coordination of care and time. But every code has to have some descriptor that supports the nature of the patient's presenting problem. And that's really where the clinician documents the medical necessity for this particular encounter. We look at the three key components first. There are a couple of rules that folks have to have in mind, and they'll make sense, I hope, <laughs> as I go through this. I'm actually going to pull it all together in a few minutes um, to hopefully help it make a little more sense than it might initially. So we have these three key components, patient's history, the objective physical exam, impression and plan, i.e. that medical decision making. And each one of those has its own components, or I should say different levels, right? So depending on whether or not this is a new patient or an initial patient for the nursing home patients, you need to make sure that to choose the code, that the documentation of each of the three key components meets that code's definition. So what the heck did I just say? So a 99345, highest level new patient home visit, requires a comprehensive history, comprehensive exam, medical decision-making of high complexity. If a Medicare or other payer reviewer was looking at your note and said, oh, okay, you have a comprehensive history based on coding guidelines, a detailed exam, and maybe that's just because you didn't have eight different organ systems documented as examined, and high complexity of medical decision-making, well, you couldn't have a 99345 because that exam required a comprehensive uh, level of exam. So one could only report the ENM code that the detailed exam covered. And in this case, I gave that specific example because that would not be the lowest, the next lowest code, the 99344. It would actually downcode the practitioner all the way to a level three new patient home visit because that's the the highest level of a new patient home visit that a detailed exam is, is uh, only what is required. When it comes to the established patient visits, now it's only two of those three key components. So to take my same example, a 99350, the highest level established patient home visit, has a comprehensive history, comprehensive exam, medical decision making of high complexity, but 
if I had my comprehensive history, detailed exam, medical decision making of high complexity, since two of those components, the history and the medical decision making, met the requirements of a 9 and 350, in this case I could bill the highest level visit. Hopefully that made some sense. So I mentioned that there are different um, types of history. So there are four from problem focused to comprehensive. And how one determines which type it is, is based on how much information is in the elements. Each and every encounter needs to have a chief complaint. And I would actually suggest that clinicians, rather than a chief complaint, should consider this as documenting what's the medical reason for the visit to help support the medical necessity of that encounter. The history of present illness is a series of um, events that brought you to see the patient in the first place, or if you're seeing a patient in follow-up, what's happened since you saw them last. The review of systems is a series of questions about past or present symptoms. It is not a medical history, so it's not a review of systems, cardiovascular, patient denies hypertension, CAD, ischemic heart disease. Nope, nope. Those are conditions that would be medical history, not a review of systems. Instead, it would be chest pain, et cetera. And then past family and social history are lumped together in, uh, as one element. A little um, tidbit from the payer perspective, please do not document family history non-contributory or unremarkable. The payers look at that as, ah, you didn't ask anything for that history area, i.e. family history because you didn't think it would add anything to the patient's history, was not, would be non-contributory, et cetera. <clears throat> it happens to be verbiage, that term non-contributory, that many, if not all, of the Medicare uh, contractors won't accept, and that becomes important. So how much that you've documented about each of those history elements helps to, not actually helps to, but does support whether or not this is a problem-focused, expanded problem-focused, detailed or comprehensive exam. Because I'm talking about palliative care, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the unobtainable history. Clearly, that's something that you encounter on an almost a day-to-day -day basis. The documentation guidelines from CMS do acknowledge this situation. Um, and what they say is that if the patient cannot provide a history, you need to document why. My experience tells me that that is typically pretty apparent in the history of present illness. And also your attempts to get the missing history elements elsewhere, from family, the chart, et cetera. And without that degree of documentation, the um, history element that's missing, so to speak, cannot be counted. And in a, when I pull this all together, you'll see how um, disastrous that can be from a coding perspective, which means a reimbursement perspective. And I'm all about financial sustainability of a palliative care program. So getting this right, <clears throat> so that you not only get paid appropriately for the services that are provided, but actually get to keep the money, I think is pretty darn important. So that's an important thing to, to recognize. So assuming that the patient is, um, uh, maybe it's a dementia patient, right? So in your history, you're talking about how the patient is confused. How might you document why you couldn't get any review of systems, uh, any um, other history elements? I shouldn't say why, but what were your other attempts? So maybe it's something along the lines of um, no further review of systems, past family or social history, obtainable, chart reviewed, no family present, something like that because you specifically stated the review of systems, past family and social history, the Medicare program or most other payers would give you credit for those components of the history as if you had documented them all. Second key component is the exam. Now here's where I need to stop and tell you that, all right, yes, there are two different types of documentation guidelines, the 1995 guidelines and the 1997 guidelines. And no, we do not want the newest, even though 97 is about 20 years old. <coughs> Excuse me, we do not want the newest and they're not the greatest. Um, the 97 documentation guidelines for the physical exam is the set that 
Some physicians have heard about bulleted elements being documented in different body areas and organ systems. I do a fair amount of chart audits. I have yet to see a palliative care or a hospice physician document, <coughs> excuse me, a comprehensive exam that's comprehensive in their minds and probably is for the patient, but from a coding perspective, isn't going to meet the 97 guidelines. It's, those guidelines specifically tell you which um, areas of a body area or organ system need to be documented. The 1995 guidelines, however, routinely are supported by a palliative care clinician's exam. So there are a couple of important nuances, though, about that. You'll see that I've got this slide split between body areas and organ systems. And no, this is not my doing. The government in its infinite wisdom has somehow decided that we have a, if you look at the left, a neck, a back including the spine and extremities. And then if you go one, two, three, four, five from the bottom on the right, in addition to all of that, apparently we have a separate musculoskeletal system. And nowhere has it ever been written that I've ever found what the heck is the difference? But the important thing and the reason that I show this is that a comprehensive physical exam is an exam of eight or more organ systems. So you could have a very complete exam, very problem pertinent to what's going on with the patient. But if you did not have eight organ systems as listed here, the payer and in particular the Medicare program could downcode you from a code that required a comprehensive exam. So when you have some time, and maybe you've been doing it while I've been talking, go through the list of about 12 organ systems and think, when I do a complete physical exam, what I consider complete, do I always document at least eight of these organ systems? If so, awesome. Now the good news is that the 1995 guidelines never tell you how much to document about any one of those organ systems as opposed to the 97. So here are the four levels of the exam. And on the left, as you can see, they go from problem focused to comprehensive, the same as the history. But I've interjected some of the, the, co the common codes for palliative care, starting with a level one hospital visit in problem focus, nine and two, three, one, level one new patient home visit, level one established patient home visit. And that would be a very focused, problem-focused exam. One, in all honesty, that I don't think I've ever seen a palliative care clinician document. That would be a, an exam of the heart, period, end of story. No lungs, no anything else, just listen to the heart. Um, if you go all the way down to the bottom for the comprehensive exam, you'll see that the two, excuse me, the 98222 two, two, and 23, and those are um, inpatient hospital consults. And the new patient home visits, 9 and 3, 4, 4, 9 and 3, 4, 5, the highest, second, uh, second to highest and highest new patient visits. And that 9 and 3, 5, 0 that I've already mentioned as an established patient home visit all require a general multi-system exam of eight or more organ systems. So if you think about it, just as I was uh, referencing with the history, if you had seven organ systems and heck, six body areas, you didn't have eight organ systems, you could not um, hang on to your money if you've been paid for any of these higher level codes. You'd be downcoded to probably a detailed um, exam code and um, face the potential of having, if this, the payer was looking after payment, of having to repay some of it. So this is really important. The third area is medical decision making. And this is where I wish I had an hour just to talk about this. But again, we do have a handbook coming. So that's great. Hopefully all of this will wet your whistle for more. So there are three variables in complexity. How many diagnoses did you look at today? And were they new, new problems to you? Were they established problems to you? Were they worsening? Was the patient more stable today, et cetera? And then the second, the amount of complexity of the data, in addition to your subjective history directly from the patient and your objective physical exam, what other information have you documented that you reviewed um, or that you want? So even a um, documentation of, say, if you're seeing a patient for the first time at home 
or maybe going back to see them at home after a hospitalization, stating that we'll get a copy of the uh, recent ED visit or hospitalization actually gets you points in um, the variable number two. And then the overall risk of complications, morbidity, and mortality based on the patient's presenting problem today, any diagnostic procedures you might order today, and your management options. So with that last one, the management options, when, when a clinician documents follow, um, continue plan of care and doesn't document what that plan of care is, i.e., is it take two Advil or is it um, something more um, aggressive than that, which it probably is for palliative care. If you're undergoing a payer audit, you want to make sure that's clear. So those little general statements about continued treatment plan or a POC um, don't help you in the long run. So here's to um, put that medical decision making together, um, depending if you do the number of diagnoses or problems that you're addressing needs to be documented as well as any data, you know, any labs you reviewed, uh, getting history from the nurse, getting history from a family member gives you quote unquote points in the amount and complexity of the data um, variable and the overall risk. And for overall risk, the two areas are not only documenting the specific treatment that you're managing or that the patient is on, but also making sure that it's clear how severely ill the patient is or isn't will help to add to all of that. And as you can see, there's a fairly complex little formula going here. Um, and then the uh, level of complexity from straightforward to high, just an example there as to which, um, which level will get you to which codes. Okay, let's move on a little bit to time. And I know in palliative care, there are an awful lot of clinicians who will tell me that, Jean, I just code all my visits based on time. My experience anecdotally, but it's pretty strong anecdotes, tell me that the overwhelming majority of the cases where that is the, um, the way the clinician is indeed choosing his or her E&M codes results in underpayment. So what are the rules though? In the case where counseling and or coordination of care dominates so more than 50% of your actual time, with the patient and or the family. Time is considered the key or controlling factor to qualify for a particular level of ENM service. So this is supposed to be the exception actually to the rule, the rule being that the code gets chosen based on the three key components. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it should be pretty clear based on this description as opposed to history exam medical decision making, what you need to document, your total time, because otherwise how the heck could one choose the code? The fact that more than half of that time was spent in activities of counseling and or coordination of care. And then there really is nothing written that I've ever found that states how much you have to document to support that you spent that amount of time. So I typically advise use the reasonable person standard that in reading your note, whatever it was the patient's problems and who you had conversation with and what was the care that was coordinated or what type of counseling and what depth you went into. A reasonable person reading your note based on the number of minutes you said you've spent should be internally nodding their head, kind of thinking, yeah, that sounds like that took that amount of time. So let's kind of take all of that and look at it for new patient home visits. So down the left-hand side here, we have the levels one through five for a nine and three, four, one two, three, four, and five, new patient home codes. And if you look next, then there's a column that tells you how much history for that level, how much of an exam is required, and the level of complexity of medical decision-making. And over on the right, how much time has to be spent to be able to choose that code. So if we start at the bottom, you'll, if you look and look at the components of the history and exam for a nine and three, four, four, and four, five, it's exactly the same, <clears throat> excuse me. And I will start here because based on the complexity of a palliative care patient, it's kind of hard for me to believe that this, these are not going to be the standard codes that you bill. 
Um, by the time a patient is complex enough to want or be referred to a palliative care clinician, I find it hard to believe that it's only a level one, two, or three that they actually are provided by that clinician. But if you look, both the 99344 and 45 in the history require that chief complaint of the history of present illness, at least four elements, so four plus. And those elements are things such as location, quality, severity, timing, duration, et cetera. Things that palliative care clinicians do well with their narratives. A review of at least 10 systems, and of the three sub-history elements that are lumped together, past, family, and social history, three of three, so something from each of those three. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the physical exam has the same requirement for both of those, eight or more organ systems. So remembering that a new patient encounter, and it's reiterated at the top of the slide, requires that all three key components be met. If you think about it, if you don't have 10 review of systems, or you've said family history is non-contributory, which the payer is not going to count, your 99344 or 45 would be downcoded on a payer audit to probably at least a 99343. So making sure that your templates, forms, little cheat sheets have all of this for you is important. Bear with me for a quick second. Sorry, I need to take a drink. Same thing for the physical exam, eight or more organ system. So regardless of how complete your exam might be, if it had less than eight of the listed organ systems from a little while ago, it's also not a comprehensive exam. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So it becomes real important. The medical decision making for the level four and five for choosing the code based on complexity is the tiebreaker. And this would look very much the same if this was a new patient um, assisted living facility. Little cheat sheet, codes would be different, but for the five levels of new patients, the requirements would all be the same. Over on the right, we've got the time. So you see to do a 99345, you need to have spent at least an hour and 15 minutes, an hour for a 99344. Um, but if you're choosing a code based on complexity, the time does not drive the code selection at all. And then looking at, <coughs> excuse me, an established patient visit where we only have four levels of service, we look again at the bottom, a 99350, looks very similar to the comprehensive history for a new patient only of past family and social history. You only need something from two of those three. Exam is the same, medical decision-making high, et cetera. But now you only need two of those three. So if you had, say, a patient who was a poor historian, um, you could still have a comprehensive exam and high complexity and have documentation to support a nine and three five zero or any other area. Now, since nothing says in anything authoritative that I've ever seen, that of the three key components, history, exam, medical decision-making, that one of them must be decision complexity, a word of caution. Electronic medical records make it very easy, especially for established patient visits, some of them, to have a lot of information kind of automatically, I'm being gentle, appear in the history, and the physical exam sometimes seems to be a little bit flushed out, I'm gonna use the term, <coughs> excuse me. I do not expect that every follow-up visit is going to be at the highest level, 9350, but technically, if you had a comprehensive history and a comprehensive exam for a patient that's being seen in follow-up at home, since only two of the three key components need to be met, then yeah, it would be a 99350. If your EMR makes it too easy to do that, I think a good, um, a good path to go down is to choose your code based on complexity. And I have many clinicians I work with that agree with that, even if they haven't thought about it, that the history and exam might always be comprehensive, but they do. They would never dream of choosing the highest level code. So the complexity should be, isn't, there's nothing that says it has to be, but should be one of those components, I believe, to keep you guys safe. Okay, moving on to advanced care planning. Five main things about these codes. Who can provide them? Physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, 
clinical nurse specialists, those who can build evaluation and management codes. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't other folks by their scope of practice in California who can also provide advanced care planning, <coughs> excuse me, perhaps a licensed clinical social worker, but her benefit in the Medicare program is under mental health. So um, at a, for a community-based program, advanced care planning is not something that a licensed clinical social worker can provide. If your palliative care program had an arrangement with a oncology group or something where you had um, a palliative care component to it you were adding, or you had an office or clinic yourself, then there is a way, but it's more, it's beyond what we can talk about in this webinar today. Okay, so physicians, nurse practitioners can provide it. Where can it be provided? Well, there are no restrictions on the place of service. Inpatient, outpatient, home, office, ALF, nursing home, hospital, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> How much time do you need to spend since these are time-based codes? Well, there are um, guidelines in the CPT book that tell you that if a CPT code within its area of the book does not have any specific rules as to how much time to use, you bill once the midpoint has been passed. Well, the advanced care planning codes, as you'll see in a moment, are for each 30 minutes of advanced care planning services. So that means 16 minutes. At 16 minutes, you've passed the midpoint. I often get asked about, well, what about time if the family calls me on the phone? Can I bill for that? Nope, sorry. Advanced care planning must be face-to-face, -face, so time on the phone doesn't count. And then what about if the patient cannot participate in the discussion? Um, even the Medicare program has acknowledged that that is something that is going to happen. And advanced care planning can be held with the family, caregivers, the surrogate, etc., as long as you, of course, have documented why the patient is unable to participate. So here are the two codes, and they are remaining the same for 2019, thank goodness. Advanced care planning, including the explanation and discussion of advanced directives, such as standard forms, by the physician or other qualified healthcare professional. And again, that really means someone who can bill an evaluation and management service. First 30 minutes, face-to-face -face with the patient, family members, and her surrogate. The 99498 is what's called an add-on code. It would never be billed alone. It's for each additional 30 minutes at today's encounter. And if you look at the definition of the code, it tells you pretty much everything you need to know. This is a discussion about advanced directives and forms. There is no medical management here. So that should tell you that, yes, it is perfectly fine to bill for a problem-oriented evaluation and management service, assuming that's been provided, and advanced care planning at the same encounter. Now there's modifiers, et cetera, that need to be used, but yes, it can happen. Also, there is no requirement that the forms actually be completed. And then um, it's a time-based code, first 30 minutes for 9497, which as you now know means 16 minutes or more. So what do you think you have to document as well? Obviously the amount of time spent. And yes, it's a face-to-face -face service, but it doesn't have to just be with the patient. It's patient, family member, and or surrogate. So this is a conversation that could be had without the patient present at all. So if you really read and di digest the code's descriptions, this happens to be one of those instances where it's pretty, pretty um, all-encompassing as far as giving you the guidance that you need for billing. Another area, <coughs> excuse me, that came out, this one about 2013, Transitional Care Management, which along with some other codes that CMS has decided to pay for and work with the AMA to develop, is intended to prevent inpatient readmissions within 30 days of discharge from an inpatient setting. Um, is something that, is something that a palliative care program might want to consider providing, but it would take some thought and work through. And I'll go over this, of course, in a lot more detail in the handbook. Chronic care management that came out in 2015 um, is, is a non-face-to-face -face service, totally non-face-to-face, -to -face, my little FTF, um, to help avoid patients going to the emergency department or hospital admissions. And I'm a firm believer that palliative care programs are doing this routinely. 
Um, it's all of that uh, interaction with the patient on the phone, et cetera, in the course of the month by one or more of the clinical staff with the organization. Um, answering all their questions, speaking with the family, helping them through their um, treatment goals, et cetera. There's a time-based codes. There's a new one in 2019 that will actually pay for 30 minutes or more of just this type of non-face-to-face -face work by the billing physician or nurse practitioner, et cetera. And the only deterrence for palliative programs, at least from my perspective in doing this, the number one is probably that it requires that you have a certified EMR. But you know, once you get into the Part B world, you really do need an ONC, Office of the National Coordinator, certified EMR because of the fact that um, otherwise the quality payment program in uh, Part B is going to reduce your revenue. So hopefully that's something that if you're a startup, you've got on your radar for a year or so down the road. And if you're excuse me, if you have a robust, fairly mature program that you already either have or are actively pursuing. And once you have that system, the only other impediment is that only one provider gets to build chronic care management, and it's a monthly service. So you have to be careful that you're not stepping on the toes of the patient's primary care physician. I will say this, however, that I think that is a more inflated concern than actuality. CMS contracted with Mathematica Policy to do a huge research study on the first two years of chronic care management. And it was less than 25% of all Medicare beneficiaries who had ever had any chronic care management. So clearly, there are not a, now this is going to be a technical term, there are not a buttload of primary care physicians providing uh, chronic care management. So in your fee-for-service world, this is something that I urge to be considered. <clears throat> um, and this is an area that that social worker who's always looking for, oh my gosh, for goodness sake, isn't anything I do billable, that some of her services can indeed be billable because once one would drill down to the detail about chronic care management, you'd find that even coordination of community resources, if that's in that patient's care plan, is something that can be worked on in the course of a month and be part of that non-face-to-face -face billable service. Um, so who can bill chronic care management? Physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, clinical nurse specialists, again, those who can bill an evaluation and management code. The social worker that I just alluded to would be, have to be billed what, under a, um, a billing criteria called incident to billing. Who can provide the chronic care management? Clinical staff. So here we have the LPN, RN, the clinical social worker under the billing provider's uh, supervision. What about time? So these are time-based codes. The course of a calendar month, at least 20 minutes needs to be documented as having been spent in these activities. Pretty easy for so many of your patients. <coughs> Excuse me. And the patients who qualify for chronic care management are those Medicare beneficiaries with two or more chronic conditions. Let's see, that's probably 99.9% .9 of your Medicare patient population. What about phone calls? Yep, for this service, time spent on the phone with the patient, with the pharmacy, caregivers, community resources, et cetera. That's all part of that 20 minutes per month. And for the physician, nurse practitioner, who's the billing provider, who's actually seeing the patient, if at an evaluation and management visit, so at a home visit, say, you've actually um, spent the time to develop the care plan for the patient you get to bill an additional code on top of your ENM code, it's PIX code G0506, for the time that you spent developing the care plan. And that code itself has a Medicare allowable of somewhere around $63, $66, depending on where you are in the country. So this can add up in the course of a year and for um, the providers. And then you have information as to the typical types of services or things to go over that might be in chronic care management there. Prolonged services, non-face-to-face -face prolonged services. This was a service that these codes have been around for decades, but
at CMS in 2007, yeah, 2017, decided to pay for it. So these are non-face-to-face -face services. Whoops, and there's a typo in the 99358. It's not a $12 reimbursement. It's, a, it's either $112 or $122. I forget which. My apologies for that. And these are used for the time that you might spend before or after a face-to-face -face visit, reviewing medical records that you've gotten, maybe picking up the phone and discussing um, with the patient's oncologist or primary care physician what's going on with them, or getting back to the family who had concerns. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm not sure how many folks are actually taking advantage of this, but there's not much required to be able to bill 99358. They're time-based codes, and because they are prolonged services codes, I strongly recommend that start and stop times be documented. You cannot bill them unless you have had an E&M service that, um, from which the prolonged services emanated, or you've got one coming up that you're doing this extensive record review, et cetera. Um, in preparation for, but um, <clears throat> the documentation is not that bad, and um, obviously the amount of time that is spent needs to be documented. And I know that palliative care clinicians are providing this service, not capturing it at all in a little paragraph with the time spent and billing for it. Um, CMS, when they decided to pay for this, stated that these codes would provide a means to recognize the additional resource costs of physicians, physicians and other billing practitioners when they spend an, <coughs> excuse me, an extraordinary amount of time outside of an evaluation and management visit performing work that is related to that visit and does not involve direct patient contact, such as extensive medical review, review of diagnostic test results, for other ongoing care management work. So I've added the emphasis in bold, um, but that's straight from the Medicare program. All right, to end it, last couple of minutes for 2019. Well, first of all, you'll be happy to know that the most onerous changes to evaluation and management services have been postponed to 2021. They were finalized in the 2019 rule with an effective date of January 1, 2021. Um, so hopefully there'll be a lot of advocacy efforts between now and then to get what they wanted to do changed somewhat. Um, but some of the other things, including this virtual check-in, um, are what I'm calling telemedicine light, which might be good. So here's the virtual check-in. New code G2012. It's a brief communication technology-based service, service, e.g. virtual check-in by a physician or other qualified healthcare professional so that's your nurse practitioner so some, and someone who can report e &M services provided to an established patient not originating from a related evaluation and management service provided within the previous seven days, nor leading to an e &M service or procedure within the next, it's supposed to be 24 hours. Boy, I apologize that I've got a couple of typos in here. Next 24 hours or the soonest available appointment, just five to 10 minutes. So the only real things to, think about for this is that, okay, what's the technology? This can be a phone call. It can be some type of video communication. Yes, this could be that um, Skyping with the patient. CMS has been pretty smart, I think, in how they developed the definition for this code so that it is not telemedicine, hence why I call it AKA telemedicine light. They have provided a way to pay for these um, interactions with the patient where you're possibly determining, do I need to see the patient again? That's really all this is about. Patients call, they either get you or you're calling them back. So it isn't a code that you can initiate. Otherwise you could sit at the telephone trolling for dollars. So, and as long as there is some type of real-time interaction without all of the requirements of telemedicine. Um, it allows the direct interaction between the patient and the billing provider. Now, this is not other clinical staff. That's why we have chronic care management and 
things like that, right? But this is the physician, the nurse practitioner, who's billing, treating the physician, the patient, et cetera. Um, as I said, the contact must be initiated by the patient. The patient must be uh, made aware that, like any other Medicare Part B service, the coinsurance deductible applies. The allowable for this is about $14. You're talking two or three dollars for a patient, and then only if they don't have a secondary. Um, yeah, it's only about $14, but my bet tells me that you're doing these things anyway. So um, making sure that a code gets captured so you can build for a five minute conversation when the patient's called, those things add up at the, at the end of the year. Um, other little requirement is that it can only be billed for an established patient. <coughs> Excuse me. And the call, the Skyping, whatever it might be, needs to, as for all other Medicare um, services that aren't preventive in nature, be medically reasonable and necessary to be paid. Medicare doesn't have the ability to carve anything else out. Um, although there are, is additional information since I created the presentation in some AMA publications, I'm still waiting, hopefully by the beginning, maybe January of 2019, CMS will have some additional information on this for guidance. Um, one of the evaluation and management changes that CMS had proposed that is going through, that is a nice thing for palliative care programs is this. <clears throat> Excuse me, effective January 1st, the physician, non-physician practitioner will no longer be required to document the medical necessity of a home visit versus an office visit. Whether you've been aware of it or not, because you may have been providing home visits and not documenting this, right now, you need to make sure that when you see a patient at home, that it's clear why the patient could not have gone to an office. I've seen palliative care notes that um, in the note will say that the patient was seen by her family practice physician this morning at the office. And every time I've read those, I've cringed going, oh shoot, all right, so what's happened between this morning and now that the patient needed to be seen at home? Because there's that slight payment differential more for a home visit versus an office visit. It's probably a dollar and change, but this is where the Medicare program may be counting its pennies, but they have rules they have to carry, they have to uh, follow, and um, to pay for a service that's more expensive when another service less expensive would have sufficed is something the Medicare program isn't allowed to do. So nice to have that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, requirement alleviated come January. So it won't be something that has to be documented. The medical necessity of the home visit as in any visit, of course, has, will still continue to have to be documented, but at least it won't be that you have to say why the patient couldn't have been seen in an office today. The other thing is that the history of present illness and the chief complaint, well, not the chief complaint so much, but the history of present illness is one of those areas in e &M that must be documented by the billing provider. And while the Medicare program has said that come January, they will allow that information to be documented by other um, auxiliary staff or even the patient him or herself and have it count for the code as long as the billing practitioner documents that they've reviewed and updated the information as needed. Note that this is only for office visits. So if you don't have a palliative care clinic, this won't apply to you. And that's one of the good news for palliative care that you, I'm hoping won't change come 2021 when really some onerous components of what CMS wants to do will kick in, is that it's only so far for office visits. Um, and so those are the only real changes here. Um, then I've given you some resources, the Evaluation and Management Services Guide. That's a long URL, but this is so much more um, informative than the straight e &M guidelines document from CMS still from CMS, but the narrative component of it to understand if what needs to be documented in an actual visit is so much better here. And then the most recent um, um, advanced care planning document and the webpage uh, for CMS for chronic care management. So I think that's, um, we've got maybe a couple of minutes, maybe five minutes left for some questions. So Kate or someone, I turn it over to you. 
Sure thing. Thank you so much, wow. Jean. That was such a rich and informative presentation, and you covered a whole lot of information in a short amount of time, so thank you. Um, so folks on the phone, we do have just a couple of minutes um, to answer questions live, but again, if you type a question in and we don't get to it, we'll make sure to have Jean address it in the Q&A section of the handbook that she's going to be pulling together. So I do encourage you to um, type in your questions right now and send them our way, and we'll get to just a few of them in the next couple of minutes. So there are two questions already in there. Um, and again, while others um, type, we'll go ahead with just these two. So the first question um, came in a little while ago, and it was kind of confirming, I think, what one of our listeners uh, thought she was hearing. And she just wanted to confirm um, the question of, so she was interpreting what you were saying to say, we can book an e &M code based on either the key components or time-based for a portion of the consultation and an advanced care planning code to build for the ACP time portion at the same face-to-face -face consult. That was the, her, her interpretation, and she wanted to confirm that. Yes, she's correct. And I would ask her to think since, um, as she might be able to tell, I'm a bigger proponent of palliative care clinicians, when it's appropriate, of course, billing based on the complexity, the three key components. It's kind of hard if you're choosing the E&M code based on time, and since advanced care planning is a time-based code, to parse out what is a fairly fluid conversation to be able to do that. But yes, they are both billable. Um, if indeed an E&M code and an advanced care planning code are going out on a claim regardless of the payer, <coughs> excuse me, um, to get paid for both, I strongly urge that billing add modifier 25 to the evaluation and management visit code. Great, thank you, Jean. So another question that has come in is, can you state again how social workers, counselors, chaplains, et cetera, bill for their services provided under the supervision of the clinician? Sure, so social workers, if they're a licensed clinical social worker, can actually be a Medicare provider. Social workers, um, Medicare benefit category, however, is mental health. So the only straight from the social worker to the Medicare program billable services are psychological services, counseling, um, patient, and then all of the requirements of the psych codes need to be met because there are psych codes with treatment plans and duration and frequency and your treatment goals, et cetera. So when it comes to chronic care management, clinical staff, under the general supervision of the billing physician or nurse practitioner. So general supervision means that the individual who's providing the service, excuse me one second, <coughs> sorry, could reach the person by telephone if need be, if they had, had a, a problem or a question, um, can provide the service and it gets billed under that billing physician. Now, clearly a clinical social worker is a clinical person. I'm not sure how anybody would look at a chaplain. Um, don't know that they would be considered clinical staff. Boy, that would be, a, that's a good one. I've actually never had to think about that before. Oh, shoot. So I'm gonna have to think about that one when I write this question's answer up in the handbook, but um, I'm not sure that it can be now. Um, yeah, and I, the advanced, so for, especially for advanced care planning, and clearly they can have these discussions, but um, ah, no, for chronic care management, they could, for advanced care planning, they probably could, but they'd have to have the billing clinician, physician or nurse practitioner needs to have initiated the service. So what does that mean? To be able to bill for services under a billing provider, such as a physician or nurse practitioner, when that individual did not personally provide the service, that's what incident to billing is all about. And it is strictly a part B billing um, uh, situation. So if there's anybody listening who also has a hospice, please do not think that you can incorporate this in any hospice billing for physician services. This is strictly for part B. So if I'm the physician or nurse practitioner, I see the patient and I um, start a conversation or ask the patient if he's comfortable having an advanced care planning discussion. And I know that my social worker or my chaplain could, is actually the best person to be able to have the conversation with this individual and has maybe even the time that needs to be um, 
allowed to be able to have a thorough, in-depth conversation. And the patient agrees, in my plan, I might document something along the lines of, at today's visit, <clears throat> excuse me, um, patient would like to have a discussion on advanced care planning and agrees to meet with fill in the blank. So now the, uh, the social worker, the chaplain sees the patient, documents their entire discussion, what forms that they may have gone over with the patient, whether or not they, um, the, they, the patient signed the forms, et cetera. And since advanced care planning are time-based codes, very important to document how much time was spent in that discussion. The billing of the 99497 with or without 99498 can happen under the name and NPI to Medicare of the physician or nurse practitioner who initiated the discussion. Does not have to be on the same day, although it could be on the same day. Hopefully that answered that. Thank you, Jean. That was really wonderful and actually answered another question that had come in as well. Mm -hmm. So we are out of time, unfortunately, and a few folks have written other questions in. We will make sure to get those to Jean, and she will address those in the handbook that we'll be posting on our website in February. If there are any really time-sensitive questions that folks would love feedback on sooner than that, um, please let me know by email. I think most of you have my email from, from various communications, but it's K Myers K-M-E-Y-E-R-S at chcf.org, or my colleague Elisa Bond's email is on this last slide, ebond at chcf.org. You can zip questions over to us if they're time sensitive, and we'll, we'll work with Jean to get any of those answered uh, sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I just want to say thank you, thank you, Jean, for a wonderful, informative webinar and persevering through a case of laryngitis. Your voice held up really well. <laughs> so okay. thanks again for your time. We'll get the recording and slides um, up on our CHCF website within the next couple weeks and the handbook up uh, in February 2019. So thanks, everyone, for joining, and, and a huge thanks to, to Jean. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye Thank now. Bye-bye.